for this. Thank you, Dr. Knight. I appreciate that. There's... Anybody else ready for this? It's 11, it's 11.48, but it's daylight savings time, so it's really, I, 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 we just started. <laughs> right? I get that hour back right here. How, how, many of you, how many of you will give me just 10 minutes for the message? Can I get 10 minutes? Can I see a show of hands? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Okay, plenty of time. Um, but I do want to begin by reading the scripture. We're in the middle of studying Ezra and Nehemiah, which is uh, actually, it's a story of refugees coming home. It's what it is. It's a story of God's people encountering a, a brand new start, a new beginning. It's a story about God's people who were living in exile, surrounded by a culture that had no desire to honor God and was seeking to confuse or replace everything they had been taught about what it meant to be a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're, 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 we're learning the story of people who were stirred by God, some who were God followers and some who weren't God followers, and yet they were stirred by God to accomplish God's purpose. And now we come to the story in chapter three of Ezra as the, the, the people who have been sent back by Cyrus to Jerusalem to rebuild the city have made that long journey from Babylon, Iran, uh, to uh, Jerusalem in modern day Israel. That journey would have taken them seven or eight months and now they're there uh, beginning a reconstruction project that would be significant, costly, and take far longer than they thought it would. But we're gonna see today two things we're gonna look at in particular. One is where they started and why that is important. And then secondly, we're gonna see that in the new thing that God was doing, there were very different responses from different groups of people and what God wants us to think about that. And all of this may be relevant if there is anybody here or listening to the sound of my voice who feels like they're in a new season of some sort. And it may be a new season because you got a promotion or you just got into a new relationship. It may be a new season because uh, you, you just joined a new team or are moving into a new home. But many people are in new seasons today not because of what they would consider to be an upgrade. Many people are in new seasons today because you ended up someplace over the last two years that you didn't think you would be, and maybe you don't want to be where you find yourself today. And maybe most of us would say we're somewhere in between. There are parts of our life that we can look at and say, that's in a really good place. And then there are other parts of our life that we look at and think, how did I get here, and how do I fix this mess that I'm staring at? So in Ezra chapter three, we're going to read as they begin uh, this reconstruction project. And um, we're gonna read the first seven verses and then drop down and read uh, verse 10 to 13. So follow along with me if you have your Bibles. It'll also be on the screen behind me. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man. Everybody say one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Yeshua, the son of Josedach, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his kinsmen. And they built an altar, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written. Would you say that? As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the Feast of Booths. Now pause there. If you have a different translation, it might say Sukkot or it might say Tabernacles. It's all referring to the same festival, one of the three great festivals that um, God had instructed the Israelites to celebrate every year. And it happened to be the festival that was after the last in gathering or the last harvest. And so one of the things that made this festival unique typically was that it would be a festival when people would come from all the surrounding towns and tribes. They would come to Jerusalem and everybody's barns would be full because they've had the entire harvest season 
to harvest. So imagine if you can go back to when you were in high school or junior high and you got to invite all your friends over and mom had just gone to Costco, right? Or for, for me, when I was growing up in Texas as a military kid, it was when the, Sh the Schwann truck had come. Anybody know Schwann? Oh, man, and I mean, when the, sh when the sh I can't say it. When the Schwann truck came, it was like, it was like, it was like heaven came to your door. I mean, it was ice cream and it was everything fried you could imagine. Chicken cordon bleu. Uh, I mean, that was amazing. So just imagine the pantries are stocked and all your relatives and friends come together and you're celebrating the Lord. The other, the other reason that they would celebrate the Feast of Booths was that it commemorated when they uh, left Egypt, God delivered them from Egypt, and they had to live in makeshift tents while they were traveling from Egypt to the promised land. So they would actually, and still do, Jews today who observe this festival still will move out of their house, or sometimes they'll make Today, modern Jews might make a, a tent within their home. But there are still many Jews in first centuries. They would, they would move outside of the town and they would build a tent um, and usually use uh, branches to construct this makeshift booth. And they would live in that for seven days and it would be to re remind them that God had delivered them from Egypt and that he had sustained them as they wandered in the desert. So that was all the context of the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. As it is written, verse number four, and they offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings and the offerings at the new moon and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord. And the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But, the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyranians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments or their outfits, their priestly garments, came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, singing, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But... Many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. Now, pause for a second. Can you remember what the first house was? Anybody know what we're talking about? What was the first house? That would have been the first temple, the temple that Solomon built. And if you remember, Solomon had tremendous resources. He was an incredible statesman, and so he negotiated all these treaties with surrounding land, uh, surrounding um, governments, and so uh, it made him very wealthy. And so the, the temple and the temple mount and the area that was around the temple that Solomon built was opulent by the day's standard. It was incredible. It was big and it was ornate and it was well appointed. And so people would come from all around to see the house that Solomon had built to his God because it was so impressive. But take note, that's the first house. That is the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, 586 BC. And now as they come back to the rubble of the first house, God sets them to establish the second house. And the first thing that they do is they lay out the foundation of this second temple and take note that the people who had seen the first temple looked at the second temple and, and did they celebrate or did they weep? They wept. Hold on to that. 
so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. Okay, there are a couple of things that we want to look at in this text. And the first is this way that they established a pattern of worship as their first priority in this new beginning, this new season, when they come back to Jerusalem. The reason that they built the altar was that God had instructed them through Moses that the way that they were going to relate and the thing that was going to differentiate them from surrounding, uh, surrounding tribes who worshiped their gods through all kinds of ritual and human sacrifice and child sacrifice and all kinds of um, things that we wouldn't even want to talk about, just incredibly, uh, that would make, that would make a Las Vegas regular blush, let's just say that. We're all a part of this way that these other communities would worship their false gods. So God began to establish this pattern of worship for them, and it all revolved around sacrifice and putting God first, bringing first fruits as offerings and sacrificing animals to God. And that that was one to orient their relationship with God, putting him first in all things, but also to set a different pattern of worship than the way that the people around them worshiped. And when you read verse number three, you see that they were afraid because of the people in the land. Do you see that? Look in your Bibles in Ezra chapter three, verse three. They set the altar in its place for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. Now, we're going to learn more about these people later on, but essentially these were either foreigners or Israelites who had been left behind, who had not been deported to Babylon. And because they had been left behind, in most cases, there was some resentment for these Israelites that are coming back, or they had, they had joined forces with those foreign tribes and began to worship foreign gods because they had been left behind and the temple was destroyed. So now that these Israelites are coming back to rebuild the temple, they're encroaching on this normal or normalcy that those who had been left behind had established. So there's this mixture, and it, whatever the case is, the people coming home realize they're against us. But what I want to point out is that as they come into this new season and new chapter and recognize that there are enemies in the land. If you came, if you could put yourself in their sandals um, 2,500 years ago, and you came into this place where most of you had never been before, and there's no walls around the city, and there's no temple, and your homes are in many cases in disrepair, you've been, you've been in captivity for most of your life, if not all of your life. Now you come back and you're surrounded by these enemy tribes. Does it seem odd that the first thing that you would do is set up a big barbecue so that you could offer sacrifices to God? Because in my mind, I would be thinking about things like this. We need an army. We need walls. We need a defensive strategy. We need statescraft to maybe form some treaties or alliances with these foreign parties. Because all you know how to do is be captive. You've never had to protect yourself or provide for yourself. And yet the first thing they do is they establish the altar, begin to offer sacrifices to God, and then they go to work on the temple. Why is that the most important thing? Maybe it's because they remembered what God had said to Moses. Or maybe they remember the pattern of how Abraham had built an altar when he came into the promised land. Or they remember what God said through Moses in Exodus chapter 29, when God said to Moses, there in the sanctuary around the altar, there I will meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified by my glory. Maybe they remember that when Abram came into the land, originally he built an altar to the Lord. 
whether it was for desperation or determination, this is what you need to pick up on, that as God's people entered into this new chapter, the first and highest priority was not their defenses, the highest priority was to establish a pattern of worship that would become the center and the core of their identity as a community. And what has always been central to God's people is that worship is at the heart, not just of what you do, but of who you are. And the question it should cause us to ask ourselves is as I enter into new things, what comes first? What's my highest priority? When you start a new job, do you look at that job and do you say, okay, before I look at pay benefits and structure and, and um, compensations and perks and benefits and how big is my office, is the first the first thing I want to do is say, God, how can this be worship to you? Before you start a new relationship, besides just asking, well, are we compatible and, and are they good looking and uh, do they have a good job? God would want to nudge you along and say, before any of that, have you asked the question, can our relationship become worship to God? When you start a new day, when you start, when you start a new day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, do, do you start your day by climbing out of bed and saying, God, today belongs to you, and so I want this day to be worship to you? If you're thinking about moving, are you thinking about moving because you have an agenda or you have priorities? Are you thinking about moving to say, God, I want my life and my response to be worshipful to you? See, we can do all kinds of different things and we can have all kinds of different jobs, but this remains the focal point for followers of Jesus. Whether you're a teacher, a counselor, a business owner, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, a homeschooler, a student, a garbage man, a teacher, you work at the state, you're a police officer, or you're at a halfway house because you just got out of prison, one thing remains, God's primary call on your life is to live your life as worship to him first and foremost. And what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, who understood this whole system of sacrifices and worship, Paul says, I want you to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. See, he makes this connection in Romans chapter 12. He says, Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. So no, no more, no, nothing else has to die to make your relationship with God right. Jesus did that once and for all. So that sacrifice is taken care of. But then he says, I want you to take your life. Your hands, your feet, your coming, your going, your, your joys, your hobbies, your work, and make that an offering of worship to the Lord. So first and foremost, they begin their pattern of worship as a community. The next thing that happens is they go to work on the temple, uh, and they lay out the temple foundation. Now, we don't have time to get into all of the similarities and ways that we see this um, shadow of, of how so so the temple that Solomon built is kind of shadowed in what the temple that they're building again. And we see this pattern, this pattern of uh, God's provision to make it possible for them to have this place where he would meet with them. But once they lay the temple, this is what I want you to catch. The temple that gets established under Zerubbabel by these refugees is looking different than the temple that had once been that those who were old enough had seen with their own eyes. And once the temple foundation was laid, this interesting thing happens. Half or some of the people are weeping and the other half or the other portion of the people are rejoicing. And there, there would have been some in that group who had seen the first 
temple in all of its glory. And I, I wonder about that, and I wonder what you think about that. Does anybody have in your own mind a vision as you look backwards at the good old days? Anybody? Remember the good old days? I mean, maybe it's last summer. Maybe it's 20 years ago. Maybe it's, you know, when you had to walk to school uphill in the snow both ways. But those were the good old days. Most of us have something like that that we can think about. We think about a relationship. We think about a season of life. It's that thing that we look back on and we think, ah, oh, it, was, it was good then. And what was happening as God began a new thing, there were people who were looking back at the way things used to be, comparing what was, and they were saying, God, we're really disappointed because we... We don't, we don't know if we like this. We just know that we love the good old days. And we're gonna see that God has something very specific to say in that, but I wanna personalize it for a minute because every one of us in some way, shape, or form is in some kind of a new beginning, a new season. And, and many of us have looked forward to the day when we could go to the grocery store and not put a mask on our face. Anybody look forward to that? And I'm not making a, I'm not trying to poke at anybody that has strong feelings about masks. I just went into the store yesterday and I saw people's faces and people smiled at each other and I thought, oh, this is, I'm gonna go grocery shopping all the time even when I don't need to buy groceries. I just wanna see people again. And this anticipation of mandates changing and today's the day and we're in a new season and rates have decreased and I'm, there's so many opinions about that. But here's the question I want to ask you. As we turn the corner into this new chapter as a, as a nation, does it feel to you like everything's okay? Does it feel to you like, oh, we made it through that and now, whoo, that's behind us, things are good? Doesn't feel like that? Why not? Maybe because you went to the gas station? <laughs> Maybe it's because you, you, you went to buy a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread? Maybe it's because you're back in school or back at work, but people just aren't the same. Maybe it's because you've churned through so much in relationships that really matter to you over the last two years. Now the debate and the argument isn't so hot, but when you look at that other person, you know things aren't the way that they used to be. And all of that is real. And that's not even taking into account the, the catastrophic humanitarian tragedy that's happening in Europe right now. And by the way, that's the one that's in the forefront, but there are still things happening like that in other parts of the world that we've just grown accustomed to. And so we come to this new beginning, but, but, but if you're like me, I'm thinking about those glory days in the past that seem a lot more desirable than what this thing is that we're encountering today. And let's, let's talk about it as a church, as a church community. We look different than we did two years ago. And I'm not talking about this. There are different faces, different seats. We've got a new campus in Lacey, but you just look around the room and you say, huh, there's different people than there used to be. There aren't as many people as there used to be. How do you feel about all that? 
I remember, uh, it was just two weeks ago probably, that I was walking down, maybe three weeks ago, I was walking down the hall um, where my office is on the second floor to come down the stairs to come into the sanctuary because it was a Sunday morning at 8.58 p.m. and 8.58 a.m. And I realized I had some place to be. And I'm coming down and there happens to be a window at the end of that hallway that looks out over the parking lot. And as I walked down the hall, I looked out through the window and I caught a glimpse of what from my vantage point there looked like a pretty empty parking lot. Can I tell you a dirty little pastor secret? I may be the only pastor, but I'll speak for myself. Uh, I, I find far more satisfaction in the number of people that listen to my sermons and like what I say than I should. So I'm walking down the hall and I look out and I see what looks to be a relatively empty parking lot and immediately, without even having to process it, these two thoughts come to my mind. Number one, your life is worthless. And number two, this is your fault. And it, I don't even know where it came from. It just, boom, hit me. And now I'm walking down to go preach, go worship the Lord and preach the eternal, loving, hope-filled love of God. And inside, I, that's what's in the forefront of my mind. And so I'm standing there. I stop because I'm thinking one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to walk downstairs and go into worship and sing, I love you, Lord. You're worthy of my life. You're worthy of it all. When it, what I'm really thinking is, Lord, I wish there were more people here so I'd feel better about myself. But Lord, I don't, I don't know quite yet what to do about all this stuff that I'm feeling because in that moment, the weight dropped on my shoulders. My chest tightened, my head, my whole countenance dropped, and, and I saw no point in taking another step. Now, you may never experience things like this, but, but there's something in here for you. So I st I'm standing there and I'm thinking, Lord, what do I do right now? Because I know how I'm feeling, but I know how I'm feeling. I know it doesn't match with what you've said to be true, but that's what I'm feeling right now, and I feel a little bit stuck in this. And so this is what I said. I said, God, what I really need is I really need to know what you think about all this right now. And I said, so I'm just opening my heart, and I, I know what I think, but I want to know what you think, and I know that you speak to me, and I know that you care. And, and just within a fraction of a second, I sensed the Lord say to me, I didn't hear I didn't hear words, but I had an impression on my heart. And God said, I, what, what, what I think about this is that I love every single person in that room, and I would have died for any single one of them if they were the only one. They are so valuable to me. And I thought, yeah. So, Lord, I need to know what you think about me right now. And this is what the Lord impressed on my heart. He said this. He said, I feel the same way about you. And, I'm not kidding, this is what I sensed. And, I've never been that impressed with your preaching anyway. <laughs> but, I love when you use your gifts and your passions to glorify me and to serve people. So just go do that. And it was like the weight lifted off my shoulders, my heart lifted, and I realized I get to go. And, and I came down, and I worshiped, and I didn't worship for you, I worshiped for him. And I preached a message, and I love you, I didn't preach it for you, I preached it for him. And I, and I engaged in that moment because 
I realize that my perspective was different than his perspective, and I want God to speak to me so I can live my life with his perspective, not my perspective, because mine will always lie. It will always hold me back. It will always point me backwards, but his is hope and life and joy and peace, and he will share his perspective with me when I ask him to, and he'll share his perspective with you when you ask him to as well. Amen. During this time, while people are, are weeping and people are celebrating, there are two prophets that are prophesying in the midst of that moment and listen to their words. Zechariah in chapter four, verse 10 he says this on God's behalf. He says, whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. In other words, if you despise this because it's small, I'm going to complete it and the person I sent to finish the job is going to finish the job. The prophet Haggai said this, who is left among you who saw the house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord. Alec, would you come to the platform? And I point those out because that was God's perspective. And, and it's important for all of us to know that just because we show up or just because we come to church or just because we're in the middle of something, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have God's perspective about it. You may be married you may have a job. You may think you know what your life is all about. But listen, if, if you don't stop and say, God, I want to know what you think. I want to know what your heart is. You could be in the right place for the wrong reason. Because you know what you want out of that moment, out of that assignment. But God may want something different. And I'm telling you, students, you, you're in school. You're going to school. You have a school. It may be Temwater, it may be Oli, it may be homeschool, it may be classical conversations, it may be Hawks Prairie, Lacey, SPS. I'm trying not to leave anybody out. Wherever. But I, I tell you what, the primary reason that God has you in that school is not to get a diploma. The primary reason is he wants to shape your heart to know his love for you, even though sometimes it feels like you're in a foreign land. He wants to teach you one of the most valuable lessons that you'll ever learn. And that is what it means to love your enemies. To serve people who don't deserve it. And he wants to teach you that in the midst of it all, when it can feel like everyone's against you, that you're all alone and nobody gets it, he wants, he wants you to know that, that he's with you. He sees everything that nobody else sees. And even when you feel guilty, even when you know you've made mistakes, he looks down on you and he celebrates, those are my kids. I And I'd say that to every adult that has a job. You're not there for a paycheck. You're there because people are there and God cares about people. To every married person, you're not there just to have a household. There's something about that other person that needs a missionary, that needs somebody to represent the heart of God 
be the hands and feet of Jesus to that person. It's always about people. But the temptation will be, is I wanna compare what I see today with what I have known to be good in the past. And God says, if you do that, oh man, you, you're gonna miss out because the thing I'm doing now, when you see it come together, you're gonna see that the glory of the former is greater than the latter and you would never trade the new thing for the old thing that you were almost gonna let go of the new thing to hold on to. And if there's anybody who could be a culprit to be an old timer, it's me. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else because if there's anybody who can be addicted to what has been, it's me. Because I know it better than any of you. What the church has been, what the church has looked like. And the temptation to want to be what we've been. Because I, I celebrate the days gone by. but he's constantly reminding me that there's a new thing that he's doing. And so I wanna have his perspective so that I can rejoice when it's time to rejoice, even before the whole thing is put together. And God's rejoicing with you, even though your life isn't totally put together, even though your marriage isn't totally perfect yet, even though your job isn't all that it could be yet. See, God doesn't always wait till the project is complete to rejoice because he knows the beginning from the end. And so here we are as they embark on this new journey. They establish worship as the priority for their community. And God's teaching them this lesson. I want you to see this the way I see it, not just the way you see it. But there's one more thing, and it's perhaps it's the most fascinating, I think, of all of this. And it's that thing we read right past at the beginning that the first festival that they celebrated was the Feast of Booths. And what's so interesting is that the Feast of Booths, like I said, it's the feast that should happen after the, the final harvest, so their barns should be full. But remember, they had just come into the land, and I, I don't think they had not had a whole agricultural year to harvest. So it's interesting because they're celebrating a feast that is meant to be feasted in the midst of their abundance, and yet they actually don't have full barns yet because they haven't had time to plant and harvest. And it's to represent God's provision through the desert. Well, they've seen some of that coming back from Babylon. And, and yet their homeland is still in rubble. So how, how does that work? It's almost as if God was saying, I want you to celebrate for that which you have not yet seen not because you have it, but because you trust me to provide it. And you know what's amazing? Five hundred and forty years later, this Jewish rabbi was going to show up in Jerusalem who had a death threat hanging over his life by the religious leaders. And this rabbi from Nazareth was going to show up in Jerusalem on the, on the very footprint of this area that we're reading about now. And he's going to show up in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths. And on the last day, the final day, the culminating day of the Feast of Booths, he was going to say something that would then make sense of every other feast that had ever taken place all the way back. And certainly to the day when Zerubbabel celebrated this with nothing in faith of what would come. Because 540 or 50 years later, 
it was going to be Jesus who comes into Jerusalem on the last day of the Feast of Booths and he stands up and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And, and that was it. What they were trying to do in rebuilding the temple and offering sacrifices and celebrating with empty cupboards by faith the cupboards would be full, all of that was a shadow. The temple was going to fall again. The sacrifices would be insufficient. But there was someone coming in the future who would satisfy every longing in the human heart. And when Jesus stands up and says, if anyone thirsts, it wasn't just for the Jew, it was for the Gentile. It wasn't just for the foreigner, it was for the home, those that were close to home. It was for every person. It was for you to know that whatever the longing in your soul is, Jesus Christ can satisfy. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to offer another sacrifice. He's done it all. And he wants you to find satisfaction in him so that even when you see rubble, your heart is full because you have him. Even when a relationship may be crumbling, you have peace because you have him. Even when you're grieving, you have joy because you have him. That's what he wants for you today. 